Uh, hey, Steve, thank you for joining us. And we got the recording going here. And uh, uh, everybody, I'll go ahead and open that chat board. So yeah, if you have a question for Steve, please weigh in. But Steve, we go way back, man. We go back to uh, Topeka, Kansas, WIBW television. I know it. I started there in 1979. My first job after going to Kansas State University was in Hastings, Nebraska. And I worked at KHAS for a couple of years there. And then uh, WIBW in Topeka uh, encouraged me to come uh, there. And I think I've told you this. I wanted to go nowhere else than WIBW because it was one of the top sports stations in America. I mean, they did uh, college football and basketball. They did Royals baseball. Um, and they were just considered the top sports um, station in the state of Kansas because they did all of the high school and football and basketball, baseball games. Um, and it was a wonderful experience, but that's where I got a chance to meet your professor. <laughs> <laughs> and I should add that uh, John Schrader's on this call. I, I think you and John worked together in Hastings, did you not? We, and yeah. John was helpful. He, he was a great friend. He worked for the television station when I worked at the radio station. Right. Yeah. And just a, a small tidbit. I actually worked a KU football game. I think I did statistics for you while you were doing play by play for the Kansas Jayhawks. That was my one brush with sports fame and Steve Fiziak, a, a future superstar in the sports broadcast world. So let me just kind of give a little bit of background about Steve for all of you who are maybe thinking about being uh, involved in sports broadcasting or production. Ninth season. Is that right, Steve? Is the uh, Royals play by play by play? Yes, it is. And you're doing television and radio, right? Yes, I am. Okay, and how do you juggle those two? You know, um, the, this time in my career, and Barney, at the age of 65, I'll be honest with you, I am at the end of my career. I'm not going to go past the Kansas City Royals because I don't want to. Um, I have been on this uh, journey for 45 years, and so I really look at it um, – Ryan Lefebvre and I have wanted to work together for many, many years, and we finally were able to. And when I took the job back in 2012, I told Ryan, I said, this is your ball club now. I am here. My mantra at this stage in my life is I am here to be truly helpful. So whatever I can do for you, because there were broadcasters who helped me out when I had young children, and now my children are grown and I have grandchildren. So I want to help out Ryan Lefebvre as often as I can. So he really is the voice of the Royals. That's the way I took take a look at it. So I said, you pick out the TV games that you want to do and the radio games and whatever I can do to fill in for you, I will. So I usually do about 35 to 40 uh, games during a regular baseball season, 162, and then the rest I do on radio. But for many, many years, I also did college football and college basketball. I've cut those two sports out in recent years because I have three beautiful, my wife and I have three beautiful granddaughters. I have a very successful marriage and I want to spend time with her. And I want to, I don't, I don't want my granddaughters growing up and not knowing pop. Exactly. And uh, these are the precious years of our lives. So I'm just a year behind you, Steve. So you're still big brother to me, my friend. Uh, look back. <laughs> hey, just a quick background, though. So Steve, uh, uh, for those who don't know, so uh, before you joined the Royals and you, boy, talk about timing. I mean, you know, a championship team. I mean, you hit the gold on that one, my friend. But uh, before that, 14 seasons with the, uh, the Angels. Uh, you did the, the Bengals football, Cincinnati Reds back in the early 80s, uh, the Giants in San Francisco, uh, the Padres in San Diego. I mean, you are, man, you've been everywhere and, you, and you're still doing college sports too, right? Yeah, I worked for ESPN for seven years from 1989 and through 1995 and then Fox uh, took me away. I should, well, they made a really nice offer where I did uh, major baseball. I did college football and college basketball on the national level for Fox from 1996 all the way until I came to uh, Kansas City. And then I was still working for Fox doing college football and college basketball. But just recently, I've just said, no more. I want to go on vacation with my wife and, and go see. So, And I do 180 baseball games anyway when you count spring training and uh, the regular season. So I think that's enough. I, you know, I don't know how you juggle all that because you're talking about your personal life with your, your wife and, and 
kids and grandkids, right? And you're also talking about uh, all the sports stuff you do. And, and we didn't even begin to talk about you being an award-winning uh, historical fiction novelist. Yeah, I just started that in 2006. And that's a funny story because my wife and I were um, vacationing in Italy and I had a vivid dream in southern Tuscany about this great walled city. And uh, I, I woke up and instead of going back to bed, I wrote down the outline of, of my dream. And I told my wife about it the next morning. She goes, that's really cool. Well, we go on and tour Italy. And a week later, we're driving into this town to meet friends called Luca, Italy. And it's this great walled city. And I go, oh my gosh, Stacy, this is it. Well, obviously, I'm interested and inspired, so I bought a book on the history, and the history of Luca, Italy is fabulous. So I developed this uh, love story slash historical fiction uh, based on history. It, it, it's basically two families trying to produce a great Sangiovese wine in Italy's dark days of World War I, the rise of fascism, Benito Mussolini, and then later World War II, and that's where uh, the sequel comes in. But both books, uh, The Walls of Luca and Above the Walls have been honored recently by uh, reader views, reader favorites as best historical fiction. And uh, so that, that was encouraging. And boy, it also tells us again how talented you are as a writer, as well as being a sports announcer and broadcaster. So kudos to you, my friend. I want to keep things going here. I'm going to uh, spend uh, the next uh, five or 10 minutes uh, talking with you specifically about some questions. And then we're going to go to our chat board and I'm going to throw some questions at you that our students and other people are, are putting in here for you. So first of all, there's a pandemic going on. And this weekend, what do you have? The White Sox tonight? They're doing a homestand with the Royals? Yes. How weird is that? Not having fans in the stadium. And doing we got to that part, Barney. But really the most difficult part is when the team is on the road. Currently, they're at home at Kauffman Stadium, so I can see everything. I can see where the defenders are. But remember, when the, the team is on the road, we are taking it off the television monitor, much like you are wa watching it on TV. So I can't see what the base runners are doing. I can't see where the defenders are. There's so many things I can't see. But that said, during a pandemic, with so many lives lost, with so many people out of work, I just am very grateful to have a job and uh, I, I feel very, very blessed. So I really don't complain. It is more difficult, but I'm going to grind through this. And obviously the Royals are going through a building time right now where they have a lot of young players. And currently we're 10 games under 500. So it's, it's a challenge. Let me see here. What are the stats on the Royals uh, going up against the Sox? Sox are 23-15. Royals are 14-24. and 24. So, yeah, you're right. This is uh, one of those years the Royals are hoping they can uh, bring in some folks, they can build for the future. There have been flashes of brilliance from time to time. What do you think about the Royals going forward for the next season? Well, it's much like when Rex Hudler and I, who were partners with the Angels, um, came in 2012. We could see the potential of this team. We could see the potential of Eric Hosmer and Mike Moustakis and Lorenzo Cain and Kelvin Herrera and Jordano Ventura and Salvador Perez, but they were just beginning to grow together. And if you take a look at some of the young players um, in the Royal system right now, they have won at low A, they have won at high A, they have now won at double A. Um, I think five of their organizations in the minor leagues all won championships last year. And so you want to build a winning attitude. The same thing happened with that Hosmer, Moustakis, Kane group, uh, growing up together, winning championships at eight ball, learning how to win and also learning how to lose is extremely important in sports. And I'm seeing that now with all of the suffering that the team is doing in uh, 18, 19, and now 20, I think it is going to produce a, uh, a championship in future years. It sounds like they have a pretty uh, sophisticated pipeline in their system for being able to develop and bring talent up to the major league level, would you say? Yes, and to me, baseball shouldn't even be called baseball. It should be called pitching. Pitching is by far the most important, and we are very deep in pitching. We have two rookies who are probably up before their time, and Brady Singer, who will pitch tonight, Chris Bubich from Stanford, who will go tomorrow. And then we have guys like Daniel Lynch and Jonathan Bolin, and, uh, um, oh, I could go on and on, Jackson Kowar. 
Asa Lacey, who was our first round pick out of Texas A&M this year. So you bring up those core uh, young athletes and hopefully they stay healthy. You're going to be strong for, for years to come, but they're still young. They're still 22 and 23. And as you know, Barney, you've raised kids. The only cure for 22 and 23 is 23 and 24. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of prayers. <laughs> I got okay. You, you mentioned Rex Hodler here, and actually uh, Bryce Zimmerman wanted to throw this in. He says, uh, I'm not, he goes, Rex Hodler, uh, what's it like to work with a guy? Uh, not a minute goes by without him making you laugh. Oh, no question. We've known each other since the mid 90s. And then I broadcast his best year. I was the Angels broadcaster in 1996, and he hit over 300 and uh, hit about 15 home runs, stole a bunch of bases. But that team lost like 95 games. And you know, when you lose 95 games, the athletes can be a little cranky. Well, Rex Hudler was the one guy we could go to time in, time out and say, hey, Hud, would you be on our show? Sure, no problem. He was always in a good mood. He understood the challenges of playing baseball, but also the challenges of broadcasting or writing the game. So he was always very um, ready and willing to, uh, to help you out. Well, what happened? As soon as he retired from the game, uh, he had networks calling him up. He had the Angels calling him up. And uh, they said, we'd like you to um, uh, sync with Steve Fiziok. So Rex and, uh, and, and I have worked together since 1998. And he is hilarious. Uh, he only lives a mile away. So we carpool occasionally to work and obviously to uh, road games to the airport but he's one of my dearest friends. And that's a very special relationship to have someone who can be a friend and a professional colleague and, and to have that chemistry all work out. And, and Barney, I'm sure you've been listening to ball games and you know, oh man, these two guys, they don't get along. Or you know that there is a true friendship um, between two broadcasters. And I've always had that. I had it with Marcus Johnson, who was my uh, broadcast teammate when we did college basketball and Marcus and I worked together I think about 12 years doing the Pac-10, now Pac-12 conference, and Tom Ramsey and I were play-by-play um, uh, -play and color analysts for the, the Pac-12 during that time as well. And we have a, uh, had a ter terrific friendship. But I think it mainly comes from the play-by-play -play guy because he's kind of the lead broadcaster to make sure that you get along and that there's a reason the analyst is sitting next to you because he played the game and I didn't. And sometimes my best commentary can be, why? If HUD says, man, that was a great slider in the outside corner, I might just say, why? I used to even have a piece of paper because I didn't want to say why all the time, but <laughs> oh, that was a great sinker outside corner. Yeah. And I just point to why. And then he go, because he threw a slider the pitch before setting up that sinker. And now he may come back with the sinker inside or whatever it might be but it's my job to set up the color commentator. Exactly, yeah, and, and one thing we've talked about with interviewing too is probably the most important who, what, where, when, why thing you can ask as a question is just that, why? Tell me why, and you've done that. Uh, on a more serious note here, we were talking a little bit about the whole professional sports reaction, the boycotts last week to the Kenosha, Wisconsin law enforcement shooting of Jacob Blake here. Uh, you saw that unfold in Major League Baseball. What, what are your thoughts about this intersection of social justice issues like Black Lives Matter and this particular shooting? And now we're seeing this massive uh, participation with professional sports. We, we were talking about what some uh, Major League Baseball, the NBA, NBA. Your thoughts? You know, um, I saw a post that a friend put on Facebook the other day and I responded, but his comment was that he will never go to a ball game again because these players, they have disrespected the country, they have disrespected the flag. And I was very upset because I believe as a citizen of democracy, doesn't matter if you're the United States, but if you're a citizen of, the, of a democracy, you have an obligation to speak out when you see wrong going on in the world. And these are young men who are taking a knee who are speaking out, but everything, maybe boycotting a game, but everything they have done is peacefully. And I love that. 
And there is, we do have problems in America. We do have systemic racism. I love my country dearly, Barney, but I am not proud of the fact that when we freed the slaves in the 1860s, they were promised uh, 40 acres and a mule and were never given that. I love my country, but I'm not proud of the fact that for almost 100 years, we made it illegal for Native Americans to practice their religion. They were placed in prison for practicing their faith in a country that was founded on religious freedom. I, I love my country, but I'm not proud of the fact that we did redlining. I, I love my country, but I'm not proud of the fact that, I'm not sure if the students know this, but during World War II, when veterans came back from World War II, all veterans were given a free interest loan, except for black veterans. If that's not systemic racism, I don't know what is. And if you take a look at what, what has taken place in the infrastructure in our inner cities, in Detroit, LA, Chicago, Oakland, it doesn't matter where you look. When we put a highway down, where did they put the highway? It was put immediately down any thriving black business, uh, thriving black banks, uh, uh, bl black businesses. They put it right down the middle, almost like they wanted to stop it. So we have had systemic racism. And how dare you say that you criticize an athlete for standing up or taking a knee? He's basically saying enough is enough and he's doing it peacefully. And to me, I think everything should be done peacefully because if you, if you choose violence in any way at all, I think you're gonna help the other side. And that's a follow-up question for you, Steve, because we've okay. been talking here about the players, but something that I thought was really interesting and unusual this time, unusual to me anyway, was the uh, the, the buy-in, uh, the participation by a lot of the, the team ownership. Yes. Supporting. You know, Barney, that's why I'm so proud to work at the end of my career for an organization that I really respect and that I think has incredible compassion. And that starts at the top. It was with the Glass family and now with the Sherman family. But Dayton Moore is an exceptional general manager. And he's made sure our Royals are really involved in urban development. Um, he has the CU in the Major Leagues program. We have the Urban Youth Academy. We have a reviving baseball in the inner city. We have, uh, and, and if students come to Kansas City, I urge you to go to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I, I'm proud of the fact that we have an ownership group that gets out there and is trying to make the world a better place. So I, I, I'm very proud that when the owners stepped up, particularly um, the NBA owners, the uh, Major League Baseball owners have been stepping up. I do think it'll be interesting with the NFL because just the fact that they're um, allowing, what, 20% fans into the games and uh, when hockey and the NBA and Major League Baseball saying, no, we've got to control the virus before. And uh, uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's some irresponsibility going on, but I do think it'll be interesting what the NFL owners, because they're a little more, um, they're, Barney, for lack of a, a better word, I think they're a little less liberal than I am. <laughs> No surprise. Uh, okay, see, let's go to some questions from our students. Uh, Kali Sadamka wanted to know, what advice would you give for a woman who's trying to get into the industry as a broadcaster? I think this is a great time because uh, back when I started, there weren't that many women in the sports industry. Now there are, and we're seeing more and more. And uh, quite often when they started, they were sideline reporters. And I have worked with some of the best female sideline reporters, Rebecca Harlow, who's now with the uh, New York Knicks, who has done a, a terrific job. Uh, Samantha Steele, who does ESPN, she was my sideline host. But her knowledge was so fantastic. Both of those young ladies knew that because they were women in a male-dominated industry, that they had to do their homework even more so. And Rebecca uh, was an athlete, so was Samantha. And Samantha was also raised by a high school football coach. So she knew the game tremendously. So I, I, I always tell people, it doesn't matter what color you are or what, um, uh, what gender. If you can do four things, if you can be on time, if you can be prepared, if you can be enthusiastic, and you can be uh, easy to work with, you're going to make it in this industry. 
um, and, and will you have some, uh, some difficulties, some challenges? Yes, you will. But if you can keep, uh, don't let anybody um, keep you from doing what you love. Absolutely. And a little bit of luck could help too, right? Along the way, you can all talk about it. Yeah. Had breaks, and I think I've told you, Barney, in the past, I've been hired when I never thought I was going to get hired by that company. And I've also been fired when I didn't think I'd be uh, fired. But it goes both ways. But I never let it affect my enthusiasm for my job. And I just kept moving forward. Brett Bartles uh, had a question about advice for a play-by-play -play broadcaster leaving college, trying to get into minor league uh, baseball play-by-play, -play, uh, moving over and hopefully moving up. And, and did he say leaving college? Yeah, in other words, doing, he's been- Oh, graduating doing, from college. Yeah, yeah doing play-by-play -play, and now, hey, it's time for you know moving into something that will actually allow me to make a living doing something I love. And how do I go from maybe being play-by-play -play college baseball any sport for that matter on the college side, because you've been there, and then moving up into uh, uh, minor league and, and, and major league professional sports. I think number one, don't be afraid of disappointment. You are going to get rejected. And Barney, you might be familiar with this. I mean, nowadays it's much easier. You can go online and you can send your demo tape out to everyone for free. Well, back in the day when I graduated from Kansas State University, I had to write out a resume and then print them up and then do an audio tape. And I sent out 200 to all of the stations and they were all small market stations in tiny little towns. But I knew that that radio station did the local high school football and basketball and baseball or whatever it might be. Well, of those 200 that I sent out, I only received three back. Two were rejections and one was a maybe we're kind of interested. And what it took was, uh, a guy that you and I know, uh, Barney, Fred White. Yeah. Now, Fred told me this, but all of a sudden I get a call from a station in Hastings, Nebraska. That's where Fred White started. And I am sure to this day, although Fred says, no, I didn't. I'm sure he called him and said, hey, there's a young man graduating from Kansas State. If he sends you his resume tape, yeah. I will take a serious look at him. Well, yeah. that happened. They called and I got the job. So and just remember that. You know, right? We're talking about paying it forward too, right, Steve? Absolutely. And Fred was very responsible for my coming to Topeka. And I almost took a job in Columbus, Ohio, and the boss uh, in uh, Hastings called me into his office and he said, I don't want you to go for that job interview. And I go, why? Well, he knew what I didn't know. And so he talked me into not taking it. And then sure enough, like a month later, um, WIBW called and I got the job. <laughs> okay. Uh... You've been to the College World Series, right, in Omaha? You ever been there? I, I have been to the ballpark, okay. but I have not been to the College World Series because it always took place during Major League Baseball, and I've been doing Major League Baseball for 35 years, so I've never been oh. able to. I, I have gone to Rosenblatt Stadium, but it was when the Royals played Detroit last year, and Nicky Lopez of Creighton hit a home run. Oh, I remember that. That was a great game. Okay, so here's the question. Jack Rabala wants to know, in, we're talking about internships, and we do have a lot of our students who do internships for College World Series. You know, it's great. It's a few weeks. They get some great experience. They see lots of teams, lots of coaches. Um, I went a couple of years ago because I knew the head of officiating. It was great to watch him break the game, the game down, sitting next to him as an official, you know, what was happening on the field. But So what would you say about internships like that, an opportunity to maybe do an internship for a few weeks, maybe even get paid for it with the College World Series? I think it's incredibly important to get yourself out there. And once again, don't be afraid of being rejected, um, but volunteer for everything. Um, there's that old movie, Yes Man. Um, and I think you have to say yes to everything. The first job I ever got from ESPN, and I was in Cincinnati, I was doing the Reds games, but ESPN showed interest in me. And they asked me, how about this, Barney? They said, would We've seen your work and we like your work. We were wondering if you're available to go to Philadelphia and do truck and tractor pulling. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what I said, yeah, I can do it. And, and I did it. And I did two of those for ESPN. And then the next thing you know, they called me to do a college baseball game. And I did that. And then the next thing they did was they um, asked me to do a college football game. And I was just like a, doing 
probably about four or five a year. And then when they got Major League Baseball in 1990, they hired me full time and I did 50 games of Major League Baseball. But it doesn't happen if I don't say, yes, I can do truck and tractor pull. All right. Well, you were talking about how many games you are calling in the course of the year. So Tanner, uh, I think it's the Smejar, Smejadir. Uh, good question. Uh, you have a lot of games, a short amount of time to get ready for it. How big a challenge is it for you to prepare for the next series? And I love this one. Do you have any superstitions before you go on the air? Um, the only superstition I have is to prepare, you know, and just, and always the hardest month for me was September because I was still doing a baseball game every single day of the week and college football season was starting. So I might be doing an angel game uh, all, all week long, but I had Oregon against Arizona on Saturday or USC against UCLA. Well, I had to prepare for my Saturday game. So what I would do was I would uh, work for two hours on, let's say, putting my boards together. And then I'd, it usually was like four hours of football and then go into my baseball mode. And then Tuesday, it might be uh, another four hours of football and then move into my baseball mode. And then Wednesday, I might be calling the football coaches and interviewing them. And then on Thursday, I might be doing the same with other coaches. And then Friday, I'd, 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 I'd have to, many times it would be, do the game on Friday night in Anaheim, fly to Eugene, Oregon, do a college football game, race to the airport, fly back to do a Sunday afternoon baseball game. So September's were always exhausting. But to me, much of life is time management. You have to be able to manage your time. And that means you have to say no to certain things, which is you can't go to bars. You, I mean, and, 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 I'm, and I'm saying that because I have a responsibility. I have to be ready for my next event. And when you're doing football, basketball, and baseball almost every day of the week, well, that's a lot of research. That's a lot. But if you manage your time well, you can do it. But uh, to answer your question, September was always my most difficult month. Did you ever wake up someplace in some hotel room in September and say, what city am, am I in and which team am I covering today? No, it was usually, Barney. Which direction is the bathroom? <laughs> yeah. is it over? You know, which, which direction is the bathroom and how long is the commercial break, right? Well, one time my agent um, had me doing, how about this one? I did an arena football league game in Worcester, Massachusetts on a Friday night. I drove to Boston to catch a flight. And so by the time I got to Boston, it was like one o'clock in the morning. I had a 6.30 flight. I was so nervous about missing that flight that I didn't sleep. So now I get the, on the flight. The flight goes from uh, Boston to Chicago. And then I catch a puddle jumper to Madison, Wisconsin, where I do an NFL game with the Rams and Green Bay Packers. And then I get a police escort leaving the football game to catch a flight back to Chicago, drive like, or, or a taxi driver, I pay him a ton of money to drive as fast as he can to drive me to Wrigley Field, where I do a Saturday night ABC baseball game, the Tigers and the Cubs. And when it was all over, I called my agent. I said, don't ever do that to me again. I mean, I did three events in three different cities, two different time zones in 24 hours. I was absolutely shot. I call that the uh, sports announcing trifecta, Steve. Oh, yeah. You're, and you're nervous wreck the whole time because you think you're, you're going to miss the flight. The flight's going to be delayed. You're going to get in trouble. Oh, gosh. A lot of stress. Uh, Jake Bartecki, uh, when you're constantly seeing teams like the White Sox a lot in the course of the year, what do you look to do to try and keep the content and the statistics fresh for every team? Well, in television, it's much more challenging because in television, you're basically trying to make the pictures a little more attractive. When I'm doing radio, I can stay with the detail because if you close your eyes or you're in the car or, or, and, you're, and you're listening to a radio broadcast, I have to physically describe what is taking place. That um, Ryan O'Hearn has stepped into the batter's box. He's a left-handed hitter, stands deep in the box. The pitcher may take a deep inhale. Well, that's play by play. That's talking about the current situation, but they can see that on television. 
So I might have to do more research and I might have to uh, talk about the fact that here's Brady Singer. When he was at the University of Florida, he was competing in a situation like this and only had his fastball and slider. Well, now he's got a developing changeup. How, how has that improved him, HUD? And then HUD will talk about that. So you're always looking for something different that can make the pictures a little more attractive when you're doing television. And on radio, which is, to me, um, radio is the perfect sport for baseball. I love doing baseball on radio because you can just do the game. And as you know, when you do television, it's a production where you can't tell the story in your time frame because you're being broken up by graphics or by promos or by, uh, um, well, it's, 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 it's just a different animal. I, I enjoy doing both of them, but th at this stage in my career, I love baseball radio. I will come back. I'm going to circle back. Do you have 10 more minutes you can give us here? Sure, so I sure. game for tonight. Uh, for those students that have classes uh, coming up here, thank you for joining us, but we'll keep the ball rolling here for another 10 minutes. I want to come back to radio for a second, Steve, and, and, and ask you to give us your thoughts on how you set that theater of the mind stage when you're doing a radio broadcast. And I'll give you an example. When I was in Detroit, uh, a good friend of mine became a guy by the name of uh, Ernie, right? What's his name? Ernie Arco? Oh, yeah, Ernie. Yeah, Ernie was incredible. I mean, you could listen to Ernie's voice on a summer evening and sitting out on the back deck and just, and, and, and imagine in your mind the picture that he was painting for you. And you do a great job of doing that as well. How do you do that? What do you bring, what do you bring to your listeners when you try and set that stage? Well, I've been blessed to listen to some of the very best and have friendships with some of the very best. Ernie was one of them and uh, Vince Scully was the other. And in my opinion, Vince Scully is the greatest baseball announcer of all time. And his ability to tell stories and have total command of the English language was remarkable. And I'll give you an example. I'm driving to Angel Stadium to do a night game, and it's the opener, season opener. And I'm driving the back roads, and I'm listening to Mr. Scully broadcast the Los Angeles Dodgers' first game at the new ballpark in San Francisco which is a uh, pack bell, I guess, or something like that. But he's describing the field, the colors of the sky, the ball glove in left field, the sun shining off of the bay as the barges and sailboats floated by. And I was so mesmerized by his description. Barney, I literally drove off the road. I had to jerk my car back on. And I would later uh, be having a glass of wine with Ben after a Angel Dodger game. And I told him that story and he laughed. But he was also one of the nicest men I have ever been around. And I did tell him, and it took me a while to say this, but I told him, I said, you know, Vin, it's always wonderful when your heroes are as nice as you want them to be. And he kind of got choked up. But I wanted to tell him that because we do have a, a, a chance to, to pay it forward. But to get back to your original story, yeah, there is a craft in describing action where someone who's in a car or can't see the field, um, th th they can experience that colors uh, taking place in their mind. And a lot of it's very repetitive. I'll give you an example. Um, we all know what a football field looks like, but when I did radio on football, it would be pretty much the same. It'd be like, okay, uh, 49ers break the huddle. Montana brings his team up to the line of scrimmage, 20 yard line. Uh, John Taylor off to the left side, Jerry Rice to the right. Montana drops back, throws right side. Taylor with the catch at the 37-yard line, out of bounds, first down. That's all I have to do. But in your mind, because you know a football field, you could see that play developing. And you just have to use it usually in fewer words rather than more words, like Montana back, throws right, Taylor catch, out of bounds, 37. That's all you need to know. And then you do it again. And usually what I do with my color commentator, I'd say, after I say out of bounds, 37 yard line, second and three or whatever, you come in. But as soon as they break the huddle, give it back to me so I can set the scene again. And, and, and I did the same thing with Marcus Johnson. I said, Marcus, um, could you give it back to me? Um, even when we were on television, 
once they've uh, broken the timeline. But after the shot, you can tell why you can. And, 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 and we had a great rhythm and, and a great friendship. Um, but uh, once again, more so in radio than television because they could see what's going on in TV. But that's really where you know you you practice the craft that really will extend itself when you start doing television broadcasts. But but your radio skill sets are foundational, would you say? Yes, absolutely. I always wanted to go into radio. I really had no ambition to do television. I had never done television until WIBW in Topeka, because I was always a radio guy. And the funny story is when I was in, and and these are those little moments where. In my opinion, they're God winks, they're taps on the shoulder. I, I had never done TV and Fred calls me up and he goes, Steve, WIBW wants to hire you, but you need to have some kind of television tape. Barney, I kid you not, the next day, someone from the Kearney station, uh, Kearney, Nebraska, calls me up and says, hey, Fizz, we've got a meeting in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was wondering if you could fill in for me. I will put everything together for you if you could and I'm thinking, oh my God, this just fell into my lap. Yesterday, someone said, I need a television tape. I don't have one. And now they said, could you? And so I did it, I taped it, and then I um, sent it to WIBW and I got the job. So sometimes it's like, you, you always are pursuing that opportunity, but sometimes uh, luck falls in your lap. All right, I got another question for you, uh, and I think we yeah, Samuel, this is your question. So, Samuel, do you want to jump on and ask the question yourself? Sure. Um, Steve, do you know um, how to, um, what your experience, I mean, um, how to get in college football as like a broadcaster in or when you're leaving college? I don't know if I phrased that right. Well, you know, all I can tell you is my experience. When I left Kansas State University, I, uh, I was, uh, my, my GPA wasn't that, that strong. It was 2.6. But I was our number one broadcast graduate because I said yes to everything. And because of that, I had the support of my professor, Bob Fiddler, who, uh, Barney may know, but what I did was I wasn't interested in grades. I was interested in opportunity. And I knew that if I was going to start out, that I didn't want to start out in Topeka or Wichita because those were too big for me. So I only applied to small towns and places like Hastings, Nebraska, or, um, or Goodland, Kansas, or Joplin, Missouri, or I wanted the smaller markets because I knew the smaller I went, the greater opportunity they would give me. So when I went to Hastings, I, I had the opportunity to do college football, college basketball, high school football, high school basketball, American Legion baseball. And I did over 200 events in a two year period. I, I, I averaged probably about 80 hours a week. And I know it was back in the day, but my first year salary was $6,000 a year, which isn't a lot of money. But back then, I, I lived in a, in a little apartment that was just a studio. I didn't care. All I wanted to do was build my resume. And my dad told me the best thing I could hear. He said, take this job and you'll probably be here two years. But it's like getting a master's degree. And when you're done, you'll have a little bit of money. Probably had what $12,000, but you know, didn't save a whole lot of that because I had rent, food, et cetera. But it was about building the resume. And when you're young, that's all you want to do. That's why I said yes to everything. And the same thing happened with Topeka, Kansas, where I didn't want to go to a medium market like Cincinnati or Cleveland. I wanted to go to another smaller market where I could get the opportunity to do um, Kansas State football and basketball, build that resume. And then when I got to a level after six years in the industry, two in Hastings, four in a smaller market like Topeka, I was hired in Cincinnati. Four years there in Cincinnati led to 10 years in a major market in San Francisco, which led to LA where I was for 16 years. So I really didn't have any um, ambition to work in a big market but I was determined at first to work in the smallest market I could 
because I knew they would give me the most opportunity to do ball games. Steve, we're just about out of time, but I want to leave the last couple of minutes to you and ask you to talk about something that maybe we haven't touched on today that you think is important for our students to take with them as they leave. Well, number one, I think I've said this already, don't be discouraged about being rejected. You're going to get rejected. You're going to get hired when you are, and be surprised. You're going to get fired in our industry and be surprised. But I think if you can keep showing up, and that's why when I do career days, I always talk about those four things. And they're very simple. Be on time, uh, be prepared, be enthusiastic, and be easy to work with. And I think once you get into the industry, you'll be surprised at how many people can't do that, can't get to work on time, and they always have an excuse. Well, all I can tell you is I have never been late to a ball game. I've gone to games when I've had the flu, when I've had sick, when I've had nosebleed, uh, all kinds of crazy things. But I got there and I have res responsibility and the responsibility became even greater um, once I got married and had kids where I go, oh no, I'm no longer working for myself. I'm working for Stacy and the kids and I'm very, very lucky to have an incredibly supportive wife th throughout uh, my, my time in broadcasting and just in life. And uh, the way I, I tell people, I say, this is the woman or this is the human being I want to walk home to God with. And that's what Stacy means to me. And I'm glad that we made it this far. And sometimes I go, Barney, I go, Stace, can you believe it? I'm 65 and I'm still employed. We made it all the way to Social Security. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, Steve. Uh, hey, what do you guys think? Give a thumbs up for Steve for uh, joining us today. And uh, Steve, great to, I, I, I have always treasured our friendship and you are always, you're so upbeat, you're enthusiastic. I love the fact that you're just still, not just passionate about doing baseball, but I love what I'm reading and hearing about your novelist adventure. So congratulations, my friend. Well, you know, some people like to play golf when they get a little older. I, I've just fallen in love with writing, but uh, when I've been on the road, I've always been a reader. And I don't necessarily read football and baseball books. I read like the classics. Um, if you look behind me, I've got like East of Eden by Steinbeck or Wallace Stegner. I like reading good writing. And so I just challenged myself to see if I could write a, a book. And now I'm writing my third. And this one is going to be released in February. And it is about baseball. It's about, it's called Walks with the Wind. It's about a young man from the Ute tribe in uh, Southwest Colorado who's skilled in two things. He's a great baseball player, a pitcher, and he's also a wildlife tracker. And the bad guy owns a private military company and wants to use his tracking skills in Afghanistan. So I've written book one. It's um, going to be released in February. And right now I'm writing the sequel, which will be his, uh, I shouldn't say. <laughs> Don't give it away. Don't give it away. I'm, I'm going to buy the book, though. I want to get that. Hey, thank you again. Steve Fisiot, Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Kansas City Royals, play-by-play -play announcer. You grew up in the Kansas City area, so it's wonderful to see your voice and your image with the Kansas City Royals the team. You grew up watching. You love them. They, you took them back, what, Memorial or Municipal uh, Stadium there? Oh, yeah. I was, um, we moved from New Jersey when I was six years old to, uh, uh, Shawnee Mission area. And so I grew up and we went to A's games and Chiefs games. So those are my teams. And I love KU and K-State both. Um, and uh, so to to do it full circle, to go away and then to come back, that's the way to do it. Um, I, I just ha had the greatest time coming back and broadcasting the team that I grew up watching, grew up loving. And um, now I get to talk about all the time. And uh, it, it's it's been it's, it's just been a wonderful ride. Steve, thank you again. Steve Fiziak, uh, I can't thank you enough. And stay well, and thanks again for joining us. And, and Barney, um, I, I would love to join you again because I love talking to uh, college students because I was once a college student, and it was a gentleman by the name of Fred White who sought me out and said, uh, he didn't say it at the time, but he helped me. And I want to help students um, become the best that they can be as well. Fred White was a patron saint to so many of us. Uh, what I, and I didn't go sports, but he was, boy, he, he was a great advisor. He was always willing to listen, uh, great attitude, and he opened the doors for so many people. So he was a legend.
I called him all the time over my own father to ask him, hey, I have this opportunity. What do you think? And there were times where he said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Or he would say, yes, go for it. But I would always call him to get his counsel and his advice. And he three times tried to get me to come back to um, be a Royals broadcaster. Once I was still under contract with ESPN, another time I was with the Angels and it just um, wasn't going to fit. But when, this was a, a perfect time to come home. Yeah, well, we're glad you're home again and good talking to you, my friend. Thanks for joining us today. Barney, thank you. And uh, come on down to the ballpark. I'll get you tickets when they let fans back in. You're on my list. I'd love to do that. Take care. Give my best to your wife, Stacy, too. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. All right, students. Hey, uh, thanks for joining us today. And I hope you found this to be an interesting conversation. For those of you in the uh, beginning sports writing class, I'll see you uh, either on Zoom or in class on Monday. Have a great weekend. Uh, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon.